we're going to be starting our program and I uh, just want to say hello to everybody. I uh, hope that uh, this December has started off uh, a wonderful Christmas season for you. And we're going to be talking tonight about Christmas in early Birmingham and about the changes of traditions uh, during this holiday season. So we all know that Christmas is fast approaching and it seems like everybody is frantically shopping for the right gifts for their family, their friends, their coworkers, their secret Santas, their coaches and their teachers. We're putting up our Christmas trees, we're decorating our houses, we're stringing up lights, baking cookies and making sure the stockings are hung by the fireplace or at least somewhere prominent in the house. From November 1st and sometimes even earlier, we are bombarded with ads and circulars and store displays for toys and toys and more toys. Christmas is about the children after all, right? And then there is the Christmas music for two solid months. Now, I love it, but I know people like my daughter are like, oh, can't we wait till after Thanksgiving? But anyway, on Christmas... It's all about opening the presents and either hosting or going to Christmas dinner. And it's all one huge exhausting day from morning till night. After the day is done, we look toward New Year's Day and we talk, you know, we celebrate one last night before the end of the season and the end of the year. The next day we take down our Christmas. We might watch some football. We might recover from the night before. You know, try and relax before heading back to our regular scheduled lives the very next day. And this is tradition, right? This is how it's always been done, or has it? Well, the traditions that we have today are actually fairly new in the whole scheme of Christmas. Christmas has been celebrated, or not, since 336 CE, so the current era. And since going back 1700 years is probably a little bit unwieldy for tonight, <laughs> we've decided to present just Birmingham. So welcome to Christmas in Birmingham. So how do we know what the early Christmas holiday season was like here in Birmingham? So this slide shows all the different places that we look to get our information, uh, including the Pontiac Papers, the Detroit and Democratic Free Press, the Birmingham Eccentric. We also looked at research provided by other institutions like the Henry Ford and the Smithsonian, and the laws passed in places like Connecticut and Massachusetts. We also looked at a lot of other writings, including poems and books. Now, why did we do this? Because to be honest, at this time, we have no record of how the first pioneers actually celebrated or did not celebrate Christmas. There are no diaries, no letters, nothing to give us a true view into their homes during this holiday season. So how can we even guess how they celebrated? Well, we can look at these documents and we can kind of look at the beliefs of the churches that they attended. We can look at what people were reading. Now, this may not give us an exact portrait of each and every pioneer family here in Birmingham, but it can show us what was generally celebrated by those living in Birmingham when it was still just a small frontier village. So Christmas traditions throughout the colonies did vary according to the traditions of the original settlers. Areas like Philadelphia and Virginia with higher concentrations of people who were Catholics or Anglicans, Lutherans or Methodists, they did celebrate Christmas different than the Puritans that settled in the New England area. Now, many of Birmingham's first settlers started out in the New England area. So we're gonna look at what was going on in New England at the time. Now in Puritan New England, during the colonial era, Christmas was not celebrated at all. And at one point it was actually banned. Now, the Puritans believed that Christmas was way too pagan, that the traditions that accompany the day were way too wild and had nothing to do with Christianity. While the Massachusetts Bay Colony banned Christmas out outright, you can see our little notice here. It says, public notice, the observation of Christmas have been deemed a sacrilege, the exchanging of gifts and greetings Dressing in fine clothing, feasting, and similar satanical practices are hereby forbidden, with the offender liable to a fine of five shillings. So they banned it outright. Connecticut just made everything done around the holidays illegal, such as playing cards, making mincemeat, and playing musical instruments 
just to name a few. So why was there such hostility toward the celebration of Christmas? Well, Christmas celebrations in England had become a wee bit dangerous, much more so um, than what we view as a traditional Christmas, and they were certainly not for children. In England and other European countries, original celebrations included mummers who dressed in outlandish outfits or dressed up as animals. Now, the original mummers put on traveling passion plays about the birth of Christ and the death of Christ through the local streets. But as the centuries passed, the parades devolved into these mummers going from house to house, knocking on doors, demanding food and spirits, along the way getting very drunk and more belligerent as the night wore on. And the truth is, is if this parade of devilishly dressed hooligans were refused to this request of drink and food, violence and vandalism occurred. Now, I'm going to torture you a little bit with some singing, because some of the carols that we sing today hint at these traditions, like, we wish you a Merry Christmas. You know, the much older refrain of that song goes, oh, bring us a figgy pudding and a cup of good cheer. We won't go until we get some, so bring some out here. Now, <laughs> we sing this carol in good cheer today, but those who heard the original from the revelers outside their door in jolly old England, they knew it for what it really was. It was a threat. So... So here we are talking about Christmas. Uh, Hugh Latimer in the 16th century said, men dishonor Christ more in the 12 days of Christmas than all the 12 months besides. So this kind of gives you an idea how people were viewing um, Christmas uh, during this time period. So on top of all the frightening celebrations that the pilgrims left behind in England, the Puritans and other denominations, including Calvinists, Protestants, and Presbyterians, objected to the idea that people pick just one day and a pagan holiday at that, Saturnalia, to celebrate the life of Jesus. The Puritans felt that every day should be the celebration and to pick just one day above all other, others did not fit this idea. In a sermon delivered on Christmas Day in 1551, John Calvin, as in the Calvinist Protestants, noticed more people than usual in his congregation. So he warned them that by elevating Christmas above other days for worship, they were risking turning the day into an idol. Now, to show that they were not celebrating Christmas, Puritans were known to work even harder on that day. They made a point of like, look at me working so hard. I am not celebrating Christmas. Uh, the ban in Massachusetts was eventually lifted in 1681, but the hostility toward the celebration of Christmas stayed strong in the New England area. This idea would last well into the 19th century in New England, where schools and shops continued to stay open on Christmas day until it was declared a federal holiday in 19, 1870. And just to note, the Presbyterian Church only recognized Christmas in 1906, and they only made it a volunteer for ministers to actually celebrate the day. They could avoid it and say, mm, we're not going to celebrate Christmas yet. So it was well into the 20th century uh, that people were actually accepting Christmas uh, every year. So with this hostility toward the celebration of Christmas, those who did celebrate Christmas in the New England states probably kept the celebrations low key, probably kept them to themselves inside their homes. And these uh, Christmas celebrations were probably uh, subtle affairs. So what does the holiday season look like? If we go back to New England uh, and back even further to England, we can kind of see what the season may have looked like for those who did celebrate Christmas. Now the Puritan movement and the Civil War in England put a huge damper on the wild and violent celebrations. And by the time that the Revolutionary War ended in America, Christmas day was more subdued, but the season was still quite lively. So the season started with St. Nicholas Day. Now this was the traditional day when children hung up their stockings 
or put out shoes to be filled with sweets or coins. Christmas Day itself was observed with family and close friends sharing a nice dinner after church services. The bigger feast was usually held on New Year's. Um, there's a lot of mentions of, well, we had a turkey for Christmas, but we're really going to knock it out on New Year's. So we know that New Year's was usually a little bit more of the big day. Now, St. Stephen's Day, more popularly known today as Boxing Day, was the day to box up all the extra food and maybe clothing and pass them out to those around the community who were in need. It was not like my son things. People went around boxing each other in the streets. <laughs> he was like, why is it Boxing Day? Do I get to go box people? No. But uh, New Year's Day, which is also known as the Solemnity of Mary, was the day when employers passed out presents and gift giving was always to those in service, never back to the boss. So New Year's Day was also a day for the dances, the dinner parties, and the more exuberant celebrations. Um, in some areas of the country, probably not New England, but in some areas, gunfire and fireworks were not out of place on this day. So the season ended with Twelfth Night, which, was cele which celebrated Epiphany, and this was thought that when the three kings gave presents to Jesus. This was also the day to celebrate weddings, a tradition followed by none other than our own president, George and Washington and his wife, Martha. At night, balls or masquerades were held, uh, usually an elaborately decorated 12th night cake or what's known maybe even today as a king's cake with a bean or a coin baked inside was presented to the assembly and the person who received that piece of cake with the token inside was king or queen for the night. And then there were at least six other holy days that were being expected to be celebrated at the time. So that included the Feast of the Holy or Feast of the Immaculate Conception, the circumcision of Jesus, the Holy Innocents, and the feast days for the saints John the Apostle, Saint Sylvester, and Saint Thomas Becket. It was a pretty, pretty, pretty busy season of holy days or the shortened term holidays. So that's where we get that term from. So let's look at who did and did not celebrate Christmas at the time. So we have our little Merry Christmas column and the Bah Humbug column. Uh, I am firmly in the Merry Christmas column, as you can see. So this is a little breakdown of some of the de denominations that were in the Bloomfield Township area that we know of in Oakland County. So we do not know the denominations of all the original settlers, but we do know that Elijah Willits, who was one of the first three property owners in Birmingham, was part of the Methodist Church. Um, he was uh, hosting, he was the host of the very first meeting in his barn around 1821. Now, he was married at first to Catherine Welch Willits, and she was raised Catholic. As a matter of fact, her mother is buried at St. Anne's in Detroit. We're not quite sure where Catherine is buried uh, because she was not buried uh, in Greenwood. Um, now, Dr. Ezra Park was also a Methodist, and both Willits and Parks hosted meetings in their homes until the very first church was built. The Methodists were the ones that built the first designated church building in Birmingham in 1839. So there's quite a few points for yay Christmas here in Birmingham. Now, Deacon Elijah Fish, who did great things for Birmingham, he arrived in January of 1820, and he was a well-known Presbyterian. He was hosting meetings in his barn as well, but Presbyterian, no Christmas. There was a Baptist church that was organized in 1822, and it was located about a mile south of Pontiac. Uh, and Birmingham's own Dr. Ziba Swan and his wife, who uh, moved here in 1820, are recorded in the Articles of Faith when it was first uh, formed. So, sorry, no Christmas. One of my um, personal favorites is Rhoda Bingham Daniels. We have a large collection of some of her beautiful, beautiful letters that she received uh, from her grandfather, Jeremiah Bingham. She was the wife of Hiram Daniels, and her grandfather, Jeremiah, was a very famous Puritan Congregationist preacher in Connecticut. Um, he would send her these letters and poems, and they were done be in beautiful calligraphy, 
But they were always admonishing her and telling her about her obligations to Puritan ideals. So we had sadly have to mark her in a possibly no Christmas. Now I say possibly no Christmas because the Daniels family um, were from a family that actually were friends with George Washington. So maybe Christmas because George Washington did celebrate. Now, finally, we have the Prindle sisters. Now, they married our founding fathers, so they're our founding mothers. Uh, Margaret Prindle was married to John West Hunter, the first landowner here. Olive married John Hamilton, another one of the first landowners here. And Mariah married Daniel Hunter, John West Hunter's little brother. Um, now, the Prindle sisters were cousins to Chauncey Prindle, he was a well-known Connecticut Protestant Episcopal minister. If you'll notice that Calvinist Protestants are on the no Christmas, but Episcopal Protestants are yes Christmas. So we know that um, the Prindle sisters' father, uh, his grandfather and his uh, uncle were heavily involved in starting the very first Episcopalian church in Westbury, Connecticut. Margaret was also born there and spent some time there. Uh, so probably yay Christmas. Now this helps us kind of get an idea of what was being practiced by the original pioneers. It's not a true, like, let's look into their window and see if we can see that they're celebrating Christmas, but it kind of gives us an idea of how they may have celebrated. And of course, with the first church in Birmingham being a Methodist church, it can be safe to say that Christmas was probably celebrated in the earliest days of Birmingham. So yay, Christmas. Um, now, Christmas transition. So if these were quiet affairs, how did they turn into the Christmas that we know today? So we can look at how Christmas was celebrated in those early days on the frontier and how it transformed into the Christmas we know today um, because we know that Christmas was already in transition throughout the U.S. during Birmingham's earliest days. Uh, even Henry Wadsworth Longfellow said, we are in a transition state about Christmas here in New England. The old Puritan feelings prevents it from being a cheerful, hearty holiday, though every year makes it more so. So he was definitely seeing that that uh, transition from, oh, we got to be really quiet to, you know, we're going to celebrate. Um, so I looked at a lot of the local newspapers. Uh, at the start of the 1830s, the P Pontiac papers started to be published. Uh, these papers uh, definitely can give us a general idea of the happenings in the area. So how did Christmas fare at this time? Well, at first, most of the mentions of Christmas were in printed serials in the Pontiac papers, uh, and the day was used primarily as a narrative tool. Basically, well, this family dinner at Christmas, or a mention of a child received this in a stocking six months ago. Uh, Christmas gifts were not advertised at all in the local papers. The only mentions really were maybe a little mischief on what happened on New Year's Eve, but the celebrations and any happenings, you know, local happenings of the day uh, were not really reported in the papers at all. So it kind of looked like, at least in the 1830s, that Christmas was uh, still a little low key. So we wanna see what changed. And the, 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 it's so easy to point to this 1823 anonymous poem entitled Account of a Visit from St. Nicholas. It was first printed in 1823 in a Troy, New York paper. And then uh, in Pontiac, the Jacksonian, it was printed on December 25th, 1840. So it did take a few years to get to us, but this would bring a new version of Christmas to the Birmingham area. Now the poem is probably better known to us today as Twas the Night Before Christmas. And it really gives America the first concepts of our modern Santa Claus and his beloved reindeer. And I do want you to read those names because you might notice that they're slightly different. The original names were Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, Vixen, Comet, Cupid, Dunder, and Blixen. 
meaning uh, in in German or in the, the the Nordic area, thunder and lightning, which I think are pretty awesome names. But um, the poem had a great effect on how Americans viewed Christmas throughout the 19th century, and even to today. Before the be poem became popular, America had a lot of varying ideas about many aspects of the celebration, like children getting toys on Christmas. Isn't that what St. Nicholas Day is for? Don't they get full stockings on that day? Why do we need to worry about Christmas Day? Anyway, that was a crazy idea, but it would stick and it would start to transform Christmas as we know it today. And you can start seeing in the early 1840s how Pontiac, at least the area, started to change. There's this wonderful little advertisement that came out in 1842. Um, and you can see that the poem definitely had some influences on the writer of this little article. Um, so this was in the Pontiac Jacksonian, and it cries out, Christmas is coming. And then the author talks of the, quote, glorious memories of childhood, including sugar plums and the malfarious et cetera's of holiday happiness and fun. I mean, it almost sounds like he was one of those was the night before Christmas children um, with the sugar plums dancing in his head. But uh, the poem was definitely a big influence um, but there were other different influences and other people that would bring about what we know of as our traditional Christmas. Um, definitely Charles Dickens. Now, Charles Dickens greatly influenced how people celebrated Christmas on both sides of the pond, and we still see his influences today. He wrote most of his Christmas stories during the traditional period, transitional period of England's Christmas. As that country melded the older traditions with those new ones being introduced by Prince Albert, the new German husband of the young Queen Victoria. Now, Dickens loved the whole season, and especially he loved Twelfth Night. According to his children, he always had to be king of Twelfth Night, even if he didn't get the bean. It didn't matter. He was going to be king anyway. By the 1840s, Charles Dickens' novellas were being advertised in the Pontiac Papers, with 18 references between 1842 and 1848. As a matter of fact, three columns of the front page of the Oakland Gazette were given entirely over to a small serial by Charles Dickens titled Daily Governess. By 1849, the last of the five-part series of Christmas stories by Dickens was advertised in the Pontiac Gazette. This was The Haunted Man and the Ghost's bargain. This completed the novella set that began with the Christmas Carol. Not only did these novellas change how Christmas was viewed in England, but they were changing how Christmas was celebrated here in our area as well. And through these stories, Charles Dickens also changed Christmas in that he advocated for a more humanitarian focus during the holiday season. Um, and the truth is, is that charitable acts became a larger part of Christmas traditions uh, than they were previously. He also popularized the greeting Merry Christmas, which was first penned in 1534. And that would eventually replace the much older holidays, which was first written in 1460, which replaced Halligdag which was first printed in 1950 AD. So holidays goes way further back than Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas is kind of a new greeting um, if you look at how long Christmas has been celebrated. What's another influence? Ah, uh, the Christmas tree. Um, another person who had great influence on Christmas traditions was Queen Victoria. And we're thinking, why would a queen of England have such great influence here in Birmingham? Well, she was crowned queen of England in 1837 at only 18 years old. And though the United States had broken from England and had fought two wars against them, this young woman quickly became a fan favorite of women in America. I mean, it was a fan club. They call it the Victorian era for a reason. Um, 
I mean, kind of like think of modern day uh, celebrities. That was Queen Victoria for uh, a lot of women here in the United States. Matter of fact, they say that in some ways, Victorian Americans took more Victorian ideas than England did. But back on the subject, um, magazines like Godie's Ladies Book reported on the happenings at Buckingham Palace and gave readers an inside glimpse into the life of a royal. Now, Birmingham women would have very likely been acquainted with Godie's as they did advertise relentlessly in the Pontiac Gazette year after year, month after month. Um, and a set even resides in our museum donated from a Birmingham family. So I took this image right out of our own uh, book. Uh, the Christmas tree now was not new to Americans of German descent, but even in the early 1800s, the Christmas tree was seen by most as still a little too pagan. Um, but when Queen Victoria was presented a tree by her German husband, Albert, the attitude toward the tree changed dramatically. And by the 1850s, the first Christmas tree appeared in the White House during the presidency of Franklin Pierce. Yes, the younger brother of Benjamin Pierce, who was one of the first four landowners here in Birmingham. Now, Benjamin Pierce, we don't think ever stepped foot in Birmingham, but we're going to take that connection to the first White House Christmas tree anyway, because that's an awesome connection. But during the 1850s and the 1860s, mentions of Christmas trees began to become more frequent in local papers. Uh, though most of the mentions were of communal trees that were set up at a church uh, to collect uh, gifts and things for the poor. Now, the Christmas tree in the home uh, was usually not put up before Christmas like it is today. So it was actually brought by Santa Claus who decorated it with the cookies and cakes and sweet treats left out on plates for that specific purpose. So the children would wake up on Christmas morning to a beautiful tree with all kinds of goodies hidden within the branches. And then the tree would stay up until 12th night, the 12th day of Christmas. Oops, wait, wait, you went, okay. So the German Christmas and Prince Albert's influence. Now, along with the Christmas tree, Prince Albert also introduced the glass ornaments that hung on the trees, which were first produced in Germany in the late 1500s. By the mid 1880s, ornaments were being imported from Germany in mass quantities. And when trade rules eased in the late 19th century, German Christmas goods, including the ornaments, gold and silver spider webs, also known as tinsel today, cookie molds, cookie cutters, and scrap art die cuts poured into the United States. Now, Prince Albert and Queen Victoria were also responsible for making the gingerbread cookie popular for Christmas as well. Other cookies like Lebkuchen and Springerly made their way in both imports and recipes to the shores of America. Several bakers along Woodward in Detroit sold these and other German cookies as holiday specials being advertised in the Detroit Free Press. And even here in Birmingham, these German treats were popular. There was a large German population here in Birmingham, and the Birmingham eccentric even dedicated permanent space in their paper to a German language column titled, and this is the translation, so it could be slightly off. I don't speak German, so it was a Google Translate. This department is for those family members who prefer to read German. Now, we actually have several donations related to our one special cookie, the Springerly, and this includes a diary from Bessie Bell Judson, who describes baking Springerly for Christmas. And we also had a photograph sent to us uh, via Twitter by a subscriber. And the photograph shows her grandmother who lived here, her grandmother's hand copied Springerly recipe from the Detroit News and uh, the presses that were hand carved out of floor joints by their grandfather. Uh, it's in a nice little shadow box on her wall. And, you know, maybe one day it'll be donated, but um, it's pretty awesome to know that, you know, these cookies were made right here in Birmingham. But many of these century old cookies we still associate with Christmas even today. Uh, they come from German Christmas traditions. Uh, which were popular, popularized by the royal family. 
Some of these other cookies, uh, the Linzer cookies, my husband calls them jammy dodgers. <laughs> They're those jelly filled sandwich cookies, uh, pfeffernus and vanilla crescents and other treats like stolen bread. Uh, so if you've ever been up to Frankenmuth, you have probably had stolen bread. Now I do wanna point out all the way over into the left-hand corner, uh, the little scrap art Santa. If you notice, he's carrying an undecorated Christmas tree in his backpack. And uh, it was very common for these scrap art images and other newspaper images of Santa Claus to be carrying that Christmas tree. Because again, the tree was brought by Santa as part of the gift. So let's get to food. Because <laughs> I, I know, you know, the best part of Christmas is a Christmas dinner. Um, I mean, I know when you're a kid, it's the toys, but come on, when you're an adult, it's the food. So Christmas dinner has always been part of the tradition. We know that. But the foods uh, served have changed over the years. When the very first settlers arrived in Birmingham, they were probably limited to the game available at the time. But by the 1860s, groceries and other items were being sold in general stores right downtown in Birmingham. So we're actually pretty lucky to have a bill of fare from the Hodges House, uh, which was located uh, on Woodward in Pontiac. Um, of course, it was actually Saginaw, but today, uh, from 1867, and we can kind of see what was available and what might have been expected on the table for Christmas dinner. Now, if you read this over real close, you're going to see that the most representative food on this and many other bills of fare in the area are oysters. Now, there is oyster soup, raw oysters, turkey stuffed with oysters, oysters fried in breadcrumbs, and oysters in jelly. So why were oysters such a large part of Christmas dinner? Well, oysters were a cheap and abundant protein, much cheaper than beef, and they were popular all along the Eastern coast. As settlers moved into Michigan, they brought their love of this cheap protein with them. Canning technology had already made its way to the US around the War of 1812. Uh, and by the 1840s, oyster canning had become a booming business in coastal cities all up and down the coast, uh, the East Coast. Canned oysters and fresh oysters could be easily packed in ice and shipped by train to places like Detroit here. And they were well received by the new settlers. Um, it was a taste of home. Uh, so by the 1860s, they were pretty much a staple in the diets of Michiganders, which can be seen in various cookbooks and bills of fare all over the area. Now, turkey does show up on the menu, but it is not part of the featured entrees. Uh, these include several of the oyster dishes I mentioned uh, and a filet of beef, which is in line with the tra traditions in England. But there's also pig's feet, chicken fricassee, spiced lamb's tongue, ham salad, pineapple potatoes, and sardines. I'm not sure how I would feel if I showed up to a dinner with pig's feet today, but apparently that was a major part of this Christmas dinner. <laughs> now, turkey, the turkey is under roast, and yes, there is one stuffed with oysters, uh, but turkey is also under game and is served with a cranberry jelly, which thankfully is my favorite. I would have to pick the cranberry jelly. Now the ham is under cold dishes. And in most bills of fare at this time, the ham would have been served as a cold cut, not part of the main meal. And of course, under pastries sits the expected mincemeat pie and the beloved English plum pudding served with brandy sauce. Being a um, kind of like what we would consider a restaurant today was probably not set on fire, but really what is Christmas without your Christmas pudding? Many other dishes on this and other bills of fare may look very familiar to us, like the mashed potatoes, the sweet potatoes and the corn. Um, and even with the overabundance of oysters, Birminghamers would have had a wide range of foods and delectables to serve on their table for Christmas dinner. And Actually, by 1885, when the Birmingham Eccentric was dedicating a whole page to just Christmas stories and holiday preparations, a list of four recipes appears in the paper. And they were the snow pudding, the sponge cake, uh, a roast turkey, and of course, a Christmas plum pudding. And we were going to pass these out tonight. It is our recipe for Christmas plum pudding. We can't pass them out, but if you really, really want uh, a copy of this, uh, give us a call at the museum and we'll see that we can get you one uh, because I think it would be fun to make it. 
<laughs> oh, I have made plum pudding and it is fun. But the Detroit Free Press also published a bill of fare for the Christmas dinner in 1885. And thankfully, at this time, roast turkey does take center stage, along with a boiled salmon as the entree. Yes, oysters are still showing up in the sauces and the stuffings and the appetizers. Um, but if you look at the Detroit Free Press cookbook, which was put out that same year, there's another Christmas plum pudding. Uh, so you had your, your choice of plum puddings if you, if you so wished. And some of you might be saying, what is a plum pudding? So Christmas puddings and Twelfth Night Cakes. There can really be no Christmas without a Christmas pudding. And to some people at this time period, also the Twelfth Night Cake. So what is this Christmas pudding? So these puddings actually date back to at least the 14th century, and they are referenced in many stories, including a Christmas carol by Dickens, and in carols sung during the holidays, like bring us some figgy pudding. Now these consist of flour, eggs, suet, which is beef fat, breadcrumbs, sugar, spices, brandy, lots of brandy, and dried fruits, hence the term figgy or plum. The term plum and figgy were used for many different dried fruits, not just figs or plums. They could also include, which was actually the main fruits found in these recipes, currants and raisins. So, you know, if you look at a figgy pudding or a plum pudding and you think, well, why is there currants and raisins? The term was kind of, it just covered all dried fruits. Now these huge balls are very dense and can actually weigh tremendous amounts depending on how big you want to make it. The one from the Birmingham Eccentric printed in 1885 weighs almost five pounds before you even cook it. And then you're cooking it and boiling it for like six hours. And then you're soaking it in brandy until it just becomes this very dense, heavy pudding. Uh, there are some recipes that actually call for several pounds of the fruit, flour, a dozen eggs, several pounds of suet, and these can weigh 12, 15, 20 pounds each. So imagine having to carry this 20 pound flaming pudding out for Christmas. Now these puddings were usually soaked in a good amount of whiskey and brandy, and they were served after the Christmas dinner. They do hold a special place of honor. So what they would be done is uh, you would douse these puddings right before serving them with heated brandy or whiskey, and you'd light it on fire as the presentation, carry that out to the table. Um, these puddings really have delighted dinner parties for centuries. Hopefully you can try making a uh, Birmingham eccentric plum pudding at home this year. Uh, so do contact us because these are fun to make and fun to light on fire. <laughs> uh, and um, you can start making that part of your new or old Christmas tradition. Our next one is the Twelfth Night Cake. Now, during this transition stage in how Americans celebrated Christmas, some things seem to flourish like Twelfth Night. Uh, Queen Victoria held balls, novelists like Dickens wrote about his own parties and cakes, and cookbooks published recipes with special menus for the day. Uh, according to Godey's Ladies Book, which was printed here, you know, and sold in Pontiac, uh, the Twelfth Night Cake at Queen Victoria's Ball was more than three feet in diameter, more than four feet in height, and included, among other things, a mirror imitating a basin of water and numerous gold and silver fishes suspended by delicate movable threads set into motion by means of ingenious mechanism. Wow, that's a cake. <laughs> Now, these cakes did more than just serve as a dessert. As I mentioned before, they were usually baked with a bean or a coin inside, and the guest who was served the slight slice with the token was crowned king or queen, and they were treated accordingly all night. But it was even though it was a great honor, there was one drawback. They had to provide the cake the following year. So sadly, Twelfth Night slowly faded as Christmas began to take over as the larger day as the as it took up uh, kind of like all the traditions of the whole season and kind of compacted it into one day. St. Nicholas Day kind of drew the same fate. Uh, I'm not sure how many people still stuff stockings on December 6th, 
But by the beginning of the 20th century, a lot of these extra holy days or holidays were forgotten. Um, but a lot of the traditions lived on. Of course, stockings are still hung by the chimney with care. Um, and the Twelfth Night Cake is can still be seen at Mardi Gras with the king cake. Uh, the king cake still has a bean or a baby Jesus intact baked inside. And the receiver is crowned king of the parade over the celebration. And yes, uh, they are expected to bring this cake next year. Um, however, uh, believe it or not, Twelfth Night is beginning to reemerge in uh, modern culture. Uh, I've even seen the Twelfth Night cake being featured on modern baking shows. Uh, so bakers, you know, get those cookbooks out, study those old cookbooks. You may be having to make a Twelfth Night cake here real soon. Uh, so moving on from food, advertisements. What would Christmas be without the advertisements and the shopping? Um, so as the 19th century progressed, the, that full transformation of Christmas was definitely taking place. By the 1880s, most Birminghamers were celebrating Christmas, and most businesses were pushing those holiday presents. I say holiday presents because many ads during the second half of the 19th century ran through the first of the year, and sometimes a week into the new year, because even though Christmas was becoming the big day, especially for the children, many people were still using New Year's Day as a time to give gifts to friends and to those who were in service. Um, but I do want to point out uh, the one ad for toys for the children. Dolls, dolls, dolls is endless perfusion. Dolls enough for every little girl in the country. I'm going to guess dolls were the big thing that year. But it is fun to look at these advertisements and kind of see what was a good gift. Um, I do have to say that one of my favorites is an ad from 1882, Birmingham Eccentric. Uh, it's a section for the women's gifts, and it starts with, we'll make the girls happy. And the next line is over 30 styles of pocket knives and 20 of pocketbooks. So I love this because, yikes, I mean, how, how dangerous was Birmingham in 1880 that, you know, 30 styles of pocket knives? But anyway, by the end of the 19th century, Santa was plugging gifts for stores, and angels were topping trees loaded with toys and treats. And there was gifts for every kind of thing imaginable for husbands, for wives, for children, for friends. And they were even separating the holidays. So, you know, Christmas gifts and holiday gifts and New Year's gifts. So trying to sell you presents for every day of the, the season. Um, by the mid and late 1880s, supplemental advertising pages were being added. Uh, and Pardon me for interrupting, but the so, sound is not working. Oh, dear. The sound is not working. We can't hear the sound. Oh, okay. Okay. Not yet. Let's see. I'll chat, I'll chat with her directly because it doesn't look like anybody else. Is okay. Going to be okay. You let her know that I'll chat with her and then she can keep going. Oh, I, if my volume's not working, she won't hear me. Or if she, she can't. Is in and out. Oh, okay. Uh, we're going to work with you in the chat because, Melinda, you seem to be the only one having problems right now. In and out. Someone else said it was in and out. It's better now. Oh, okay. So, we're, okay. So, Basically, the consumerism and the commercialism in Birmingham was in full swing. And, you know, even Santa Claus did all of his shopping in downtown Birmingham. That is, of course, according to Corson and Sun Store. So there was no need for Birminghamers to head down to Detroit. Everything could be purchased right here in Birmingham. Um, one more tradition that we have that I want to talk about is holiday cards. Here is a selection from our own Birmingham Museum. Um, you know, today we can order up our specialized cards with family pictures and updates. Uh, a lot of people send a year in review letter. Um, and honestly, this may be the only snail mail that we send all year. Um, 
so when did this tradition start? Well, Christmas cards started in about 1843 when Sir Henry Cole realized that he had far too many friends and far too little time to write everybody a Christmas letter. So he had an artist friend of his, John Horsley, create a postcard that he sent to all of his friends instead. It was a lot quicker. And what he did is sold the cards in his office for one shilling each, uh, and all the money went to charity. So that was a very Dickens kind of thing to do, too. These little postcards were a big hit, and they actually became collector's items with newspapers and magazines doing reviews on all the new designs every year. In 1875, uh, Mr. Lewis Prang uh, out of Boston created the first U.S. made Christmas card. It was a simple flower with the word Merry Christmas printed on it. It was super simple, but it was very well received. And he became known as the father of the American Christmas card. Now, the ones that we have here range from our collection. And as you can see, they range from Merry Christmas to Merry Xmas, Seasons Greetings and Cherry Holiday Season. Um, and I just want to point out the little X just for fun, because a lot of people are like, why Xmas? And it's actually it goes back to the 1500s. The X represents the Greek letter Chi, also called he in Greek, uh, as in Christos. So it means Christ. So we have quite a few cards actually in our collection with this abbreviation, and that's what it means. Now, the card that was actually goes back much further is the New York card. New Year's cards were being sent a thousand, two thousand years ago in China, um, but that might not have really affected Birmingham as much uh, as the ones that were coming out of Germany. So by the 1500s, Germans, very wealthy Germans, were sending Christmas or New Year's cards to each other, little tiny postcards that had uh, stamps from like wood carvings. So they were very expensive to make and only the wealthy sent them. But that started a tradition uh, in Germany of sending those New Year's cards. Uh, and if you looked at the Christmas card beforehand and these to here, you may have noticed that the lack of Christian iconography uh, in the early postcards. And that's because it was not a common motif on Christmas cards to begin with. It was not until the Hall brothers of Hallmark started printing the folded cards uh, in the early 19 teens. They were more space to write than a postcard, but you didn't have to worry about filling a whole letter. <laughs> they were just really easy. Um, until the Hall brothers started making these, you really didn't see those religious motifs as much. However, after the Hall brothers started, you start seeing a lot of those uh, religious iconography. Now, a lot of the Christmas cards in the first few decades featured mostly nature scenes and animals. And though many of these animal postcards range from the adorable, they could also range all the way to the bizarre, like mice eating cats, dead songbirds splayed on the ground, or creatures riding lobsters. Now, <laughs> unfortunately, we do not have any of these in our collection, but I did want to give you a little sneak peek into these cards because let's face it, they're, <laughs> they're interesting. So, because like nothing like fro frog murder, right? Nothing like frog murder to celebrate Christmas. Um, you know, and, and if you do have any of these Christmas cards, you can always donate them to the museum. We would love them. Now, the question is why? Why frog murder? Um, according to Stephanie Boydell, who is a curator of special collections at Manchester Mo Metropolitan University, these cards were cheap and cheerful. They led to this real fad of collecting. Uh, again, we already mentioned that, you know, magazines and newspapers were like the newest collection of cards are out. So the more fantastical, the more bizarre, the more interesting, the higher the reviews, the more money that you would make. So this was just a fun, fad way to send greetings at the time. Um, and people found it humorous. Um, and Boydell described the lobsters, especially as they were the horses for the courses. If you get that, 
I'm happy for you because I'm like, what? <laughs> but uh, yeah, so lobsters, horses for the courses. I'm hoping she meant like courses for dinner. So finally, here is a Christmas in Birmingham. Now I'm gonna be bringing this evening to a close, but I did want to show you the earliest photographs that we have of a Christmas in Birmingham. These are from an album once owned by Daisy Benedict. And these photographs are most likely from her home, which is now known as the Daisy Benedict House, which is located at 535 Merrill Street, still standing. Um, now we can see a pile of presents underneath a Christmas tree. And that tree is decorated with glass ornaments, cards, and garlands. Adorning the house are crepe paper decorations that were mass produced by Denison's company. And they can be bought right downtown Birmingham or ordered by catalog. Now, these photographs date to about the first decade of the 20th century, and it looks very much like the Christmas we recognize today. Again, by the turn of the 20th century, our traditions have been pretty much formed. From the Christmas trees, to the stockings, to the mass produced decorations and toys, including the commercialism and the need to buy the newest gadgets, all of that early 20th century. The founding families of Birmingham probably did celebrate a much quieter Christmas than we do today, but they were living smack dab in that transition period. And it is because they adapted their celebrations, adopted new traditions, and in some cases discarded some old traditions that we have the modern Christmas that we celebrate today. So thank you for listening. Um, if you have any questions, Chat or they can ask you oh, yep, you can either chat uh, on the chat or you can uh, open up your mic and ask me directly. I've got Melinda here saying some of the German Christmas trees actually had candles. Yes, uh, uh, Melinda wanted to uh, ask about the candles on the German Christmas tree. Yes, candles were uh, definitely part of the tradition. And in many, many photographs of Christmas trees around uh, the United States during the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s, you see a bucket of sand <laughs> next to the Christmas tree just in case those uh, branches caught on fire. You would probably just light the uh, candles once uh, because it was a definite fire hazard. Okay, no, no other questions? Uh, well, if we look really close on the tree that I have up right now, it looks like there is some kind of homemade popcorn garland. We couldn't blow it up um, to, to see if it was popcorn, but in many recipe books and in many how to decorate for Christmas, uh, you would use uh, stale popcorn, uh, which doesn't break as easily as fresh popcorn. Uh, and it was tradition then to take that popcorn after Christmas was over and string it on outside trees for the birds to consume. That one, um, I'm not positive. I see the, I haven't seen the crap. I could, you know, I haven't seen every single uh, book, but in the two or three cookbooks that I went through for that are in this area, uh, I did not see cranberries. I did see popcorn. But that doesn't mean there wasn't cranberries there. It could very well be in other, in other uh, books. Yes. Any other questions? Okay. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. We are German heritage and um, our, our Christmas trees. Um, the neighbor across the street to Mrs. Burgess Hagen. <laughs> <laughs> If you can hear it, she's my piano teacher and she had the little candles on her tree, which with six children in our house was a little too <laughs> risky <laughs> to try. Yes, uh, actually the Christmas tree that was displayed in 1849 in uh, the Godey's Ladies book for Queen Victoria uh, has tiny little candles that are lit, at least in the illustration. Do you know how or when we got the Santa coming into Birmingham and the little Santa house? 
Oh, in Shane Park? Yeah. Uh, I am not sure because I only uh, went up to about 1900. Um, but I do know that uh, Santas were coming to Jacobson's uh, and doing, you could go and sit on Santa's lap in Jacobson's in the 1950s. Maybe you want to know about the biggest celebration of St. Lucia. You know anything about that in December? Uh, St. Lucia, I did not see that in my research. Um, I was kind of going uh, under the uh, English, but I do know that uh, the Roman Catholics had different St. Days. Uh, like the English celebrated uh, St. Thomas Becket, which was not necessarily celebrated by other European countries because Thomas Beckett was a English saint. So I was going by what, what the New England would have looked like versus say the Pennsylvania or other areas. So, but I'll have to look into that. The 12 days of Christmas, is that from December 25th to January 6th? What are yes, those are the 12 days. That's why Twelfth Night is, the Epiphany is known as Twelfth Night. So, yeah. Um, but the whole season starts December 6th with St. Nicholas Day, or it did. And it was a season filled with a lot of feasts and celebrations and um, gatherings. It all sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like I like to celebrate a little bit more than Christmas Day. We do we do Twelfth Night at my house, and we have a lot of fun with that. I, I do Springerly cookies, and I do uh, I do all the plum puddings and Twelfth Night cake, and we have a lot of fun. We gain a lot of weight. <laughs> you mentioned Fufferneus; those are really hard to find. But we I grew up with the Fufferneus cookies. Uh, yes, we get them every year too. Those are my husband's favorite. Mm. There was one question I knew you covered this. It says, any idea where the term Xmas originated? Oh, the term, uh, somebody asked, where did the term Xmas originate? So it actually originated with the monks uh, back in the 1500s while they were doing illuminated manuscripts. Um, everything had to be handwritten out. Uh, and the X uh, is the letter uh, chi, which is how it's pronounced in the English, or, or the letter he, which is pronounced in Greek. And that X was a representation of Christos. So Xmas is just the feast of Christ. Uh, but it was a lot easier for the monks to, to shorten the, where, where they could you know, take shortcuts, they could, because imagine writing the entire Bible out by hand over and over and over again. It was uh, it was a daunting task. <laughs> uh, yeah, somebody mentioned that the German foods sound familiar. Um, yes, because again, uh, the when when Prince Albert married Queen Victoria, he brought to Buckingham Palace a lot of these German traditions that a lot of English people had not known before. Um, the, the English plum pudding, the plum pudding was definitely an English tradition, but the Christmas tree, the decorations, the different cookies, uh, St. Nicholas, uh, these were all coming uh, out of, uh, you know, Eastern Europe and uh, uh, Germany. Um, you know, and there's also, I, I just have to throw this out there. There's also the, you know, the story of the Christmas spider. Well, when I mentioned the um, spider webs that came out of uh, Germany with the ornaments, um, what we call tinsel today uh, was an old Ukrainian German 
um, folk tale about spiders wanting to see the Christmas tree and being blessed by Jesus because they spun these webs all over the Christmas tree to see the Christmas tree and and he turned them into gold and silver when blessing the house so that the spiders could, you know, contribute. Uh, so a lot of German and Ukrainian and Polish families will actually have a Christmas spider in their Christmas tree and they'll throw that tinsel, which I mean, I know a lot of people throw that tinsel on their Christmas tree. And that was to represent the um, the spider webs. Uh, so when you throw tinsel on your tree, you're actually recreating the story of the Christmas spider. <laughs> cool. yeah. Did you find much about Christmas Eve celebrations? So Christmas Eve was uh, another holy day. Um, and that was, uh, uh, it would have been, Oh, I don't have which day that was. I didn't, I wrote down, but it was, it was another holy day. Uh, it would be but, Christmas. It would be the eve of the 25th. So the 24th. Right. And the 24th was another, another feast. And I can't remember which one it was. I'm so sorry. Um, but, but there were just so many uh, from so many different uh so many different cultures across Europe. I kind of just tried to stick to the New England ones. Um, but really Christmas Eve wasn't until until the, you know, until that poem, um, Twas the Night Before Christmas, people really didn't celebrate Christmas Eve because it, it was, you know, if you were Puritan, you didn't celebrate at all. And if you were any other dynamic, you know, if you did celebrate, you were probably um, spending Christmas Day as, you know, a family dinner. Uh, again, St. Nicholas Day was the day that you put your stockings up and you went to bed and you woke up to coins, which goes back to, you know, the, the story of uh, Nicholas, St. Nicholas, who the, re, you know, one of the things that he used to do when he was alive was put the coins in the, in the poor children's shoes. So if you were poor and you left your shoes out by your door, he would put coins and things in your shoes. Um, so Christmas Eve, really until that, that uh, was the night before Christmas, uh, I know some cultures, it, I can't remember which feast day it was, uh, but there was a feast day celebrated in some areas, uh, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't a major one. Uh, and it really, <sighs> Christmas day was the day that you, that if you celebrated Christmas, you would have just a, a dinner. It wasn't, it really wasn't a big day at all. The big days were New Year's Day and uh, Twelfth Night. Uh, Christmas just kind of it was a, a if, you, if you look at some of the diaries like George Washington's diary, uh, he talks about, you know, had a nice dinner with family, had a nice dinner with a few friends over. That's about all he mentions on Christmas Day. But he goes on and on about uh, Twelfth Night and getting married and the balls and the masquerades and and a lot of people celebrated very much like him. Uh, there is a small story in the Pontiac Gazette uh, where a uh, soldier writes saying that, you know, Christmas Day, Christmas Day, we had a turkey, uh, but New Year's Day, we had turkey and goose and, and the, the captain brought out the whiskey and yada, yada, yada. So they celebrated, but not anything like, I mean, Christmas Day was just not it was a day to reflect on the birth of Christ, have a nice dinner with your family, and that was it. So it wasn't what we think of Christmas. <laughs> right, and I know the Catholic tradition has a mass on Christmas Eve. At midnight, yes. Yeah. <laughs> right, but it was not technically Christmas Eve anymore because midnight is considered the new day. Oh, you're right. <laughs> yeah. So... <laughs> Here. So, any more questions? Let's do this again next year. <laughs> well, we are.
are recording this and it will be on the Birmingham Museum uh, YouTube channel and website within just a couple of days. So uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of fun talking about Christmas. It is one of my favorite holidays. Oh, and uh, the link for the January, uh, how to, you know, surviving the winter here in Birmingham uh, has just been added to the uh, chat. So you definitely want to watch that because uh, Caitlin Donnelly is uh, excellent. And uh, there's some very fun uh, things that she's going to be discussing. So uh, if you like the Christmas chat, you'll really, really love how do you, how do you survive after Christmas is over and you've got those long three cold months left. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're going to call it a night then. And uh, thank you all for joining. Um, and again, if you, you know, if you want the card, somehow get a hold of us at the museum, go to our website, and we've got our emails, we've got our phone numbers, uh, and uh, I'll get them out to you because I want to see your pictures of uh, plum puddings being baked. <laughs> all right, everybody. <laughs> Good night. Bye.